You are listening to Mark Lack, and this is Retail 101 Online. Welcome, Retail 101ers, to episode number eight, hosted by Mark Lack from Retail 101 Online. These episodes are all designed to give you some quick bursts of retail knowledge, and you can do it at your own pace. For our amazing regulars, a huge thank you for continuing to tune in. Your unwavering support keeps us revved up and ready to dive headfirst into the chaotic world of retail. If you're itching to hear more tales from the retail trenches, straight from the mouths of real-life retail warriors, then prepare to subscribe to the soon-to-be-launched Retail Voices series. These will be discussions with real people talking about their role in retail, how they got to where they are, and where they want to get to. In this episode, we are going to be unveiling the secrets behind supermarket pricing. We discussed a little bit about pricing in the two Assortment Chronicles episodes, and I did say I would expand on that topic. So, here we are. However, please do try to remember, my name is Mark Lack, not Harry Potter. There is no Priceus Fixius and there is no single silver bullet to encompass all of your pricing needs. The aim, as ever, is to distill each episode into three simple components. With pricing, it is going to be, firstly, the nine laws of price sensitivity and consumer psychology. Secondly, it will be a peek into the various different pricing methodologies. And thirdly, the pricing puzzle and how it all fits together. Pricing is a sensitive subject in the world of retail. Indeed, anyone who decides product pricing must employ a variety of methods to ensure maximum sales and optimal profits, all while considering the unique characteristics of their store banner and format. When it comes to setting prices, one must understand that the size of the store matters. In general, larger stores can offer lower prices, benefiting from economies of scale in purchasing and operations. This approach appeals to customers looking for volume and value, making it essential for category managers to leverage pricing strategies that reflect the store's size and capacity. On the other hand, convenience is a premium that customers are often willing to pay for. Smaller format stores, such as convenience stores or neighborhood markets, cater to customers seeking quick and easy access to products. As a result, pricing in these stores tends to reflect the convenience factor, with slightly higher prices justified by the added value of accessibility and proximity. Another crucial factor to consider is banner differentiation. Each store banner has its unique brand identity and positioning in the market. Pricing strategies must align with this identity to maintain consistency and resonate with the target customer base. Whether it is positioning as a discount retailer, a premium grocer, or something in between, pricing should reflect the banner's value proposition and customer expectations. Ultimately, successful pricing comes down to understanding what customers are willing and able to pay. It's about striking the right balance between value, convenience, and profitability. By employing a strategic mix of pricing methods tailored to the category role and store characteristics, retailers can achieve their sales and profit goals while meeting the diverse needs of their customers. As a sidebar here, an intriguing fact about pricing sensitivity, especially in supermarket retail, is the profound impact that even a minor price adjustment can exert on consumer behavior. Research reveals that consumers can exhibit remarkable sensitivity to changes in price, with seemingly insignificant alterations yielding notable shifts in their purchasing patterns. For instance, studies have demonstrated that a mere 1% reduction in price can correlate with a measurable increase in sales volume by several percentage points. Conversely, A corresponding 1% price increase may precipitate a discernible decline in sales volume. This underscores the critical importance of judiciously managing pricing strategies and comprehensively understanding the nuances of consumer psychology to optimize sales and profitability within the dynamic landscape of supermarket retail. So, without any further delay, 
let's get into the main theme for this episode, which is all about pricing strategies. The Nine Laws of Price Sensitivity and Consumer Psychology is a concept introduced by Hermann Simon. Simon is a prominent German economist and management consultant, best known for his expertise in the field of pricing strategy. He was born on June the 29th, 1947 in Bitburg, Germany, and earned his doctorate in economics from the University of Bonn in 1972. Throughout his career, Simon has made significant contributions to the study and practice of pricing. He is widely regarded as one of the world's leading experts on pricing strategy and has authored numerous influential books and articles on the topic. These laws outline the various principles that govern how consumers perceive and respond to prices. Let's get straight into them, shall we? And don't worry, you don't need to write all of these down as you are listening to them. They will be on the retail101online.com website in the documents section. See? See how good I am to you? <laughs> okay, so number one, the reference price effect. This is where the buyer's price sensitivity for a given product increases the higher the product's price relative to perceived alternatives. Perceived alternatives can vary by buyer segment, by occasion, and other factors. For example, a shopper might expect to pay around $3 for a cup of coffee based on their previous experiences at other cafes. If a cafe charges significantly more or less than this reference price, the consumer's perception of value may be affected. We used this reference price effect as a strategy in a business I ran previously. We called it something slightly different though. KRI, or Key Reference Item. We discovered that there were about 41 items that almost all customers would purchase in some way across a number of categories. From that, we developed them as key reference items and then priced and merchandised them accordingly. I'm not going to give away all of my secrets, but if you want to know more about how KRIs work, send me a message on X, LinkedIn, or on the website and we can arrange a lengthy discussion. After a negotiation, of course. <laughs> Number two, the difficult comparison effect. Buyers are less sensitive to the price of a known or more reputable product when they have difficulty comparing it to potential alternatives. As an example, I can reference here one of the latest products to be launched recently called Prime. There was really nothing like it in the market and pricing went absolutely bonkers for a beverage and it was being traded for real money as supplies were also very tight. Number three, the switching costs effect. The higher the product specific investment a buyer must make to switch suppliers, the less price sensitive that a buyer is when choosing between alternatives. The easiest example here is the convenience store. Why on earth would someone pay 10 or 20% more for the same product? Well, that's the premium customers are prepared to pay because the cost of changing supplier, the time, effort, and cost of getting to the supermarket or hypermarket far outweighs the cost of the premium. Number four, the price quality effect. Buyers are less sensitive to price the more that higher prices signal higher quality. As an example of this, the products for which this effect is particularly relevant include image products, exclusive products, and products with minimal cues for quality. An Hermes Birkin bag does essentially the same job as a supermarket bag for life. One costs almost nothing. The other costs, well, sometimes the same as a house or car. And talking of cars, an Aston Martin Vantage V12S convertible in white pearl with a cranberry leather interior does the same job as a Yugo GV in beige with a brown vinyl interior. They both get you from A to B after all. With both examples, people are definitely looking at a higher price is better quality equation. Number five, the expenditure effect. Buyers are more price sensitive when the expense accounts for a large percentage of buyers available income or budget. An example of this is playing out right now in 2024 as the cost of living crisis that has hit many parts of the world. As food costs have risen, 
more people are choosing stores private label products over the A and B branded products as they try and make the money they have for food stretch ever further. Number six, the end benefit effect. This effect refers to the relationship a given purchase has to a larger overall benefit and is divided into two parts. First, the derived demand. The more sensitive buyers are to the price of the end benefit, the more sensitive they will be to the prices of those products that contribute to that benefit. And secondly, the price proportion cost. The price proportion cost refers to the percent of the total cost of the end benefit accounted for by a given component that helps to produce that end benefit. As an example for this is to think about the components inside a PC. The CPU, memory and hard drive etc are all required and each has an effect on the end benefit the consumer sees when they press the button and the PC turns on. The smaller the given component share of the total cost of the end benefit, the less sensitive buyers will be to the component's price. Number seven, the shared cost effect. The smaller the proportion of the purchase price buyers must pay for themselves, the less price sensitive they will be. For an example here, imagine you're dining out with friends and when the bill arrives, it's split evenly among everyone at the table, regardless of what each person ordered. In this scenario, individuals may feel more inclined to order additional items or more expensive dishes because they perceive the cost as shared among the group. As a result, they may be more willing to indulge in higher priced items or add-ons such as appetizers, desserts or alcoholic beverages than if they were paying for their meal individually. The shared cost effect can lead to a situation where individuals collectively spend more money than they would if each person were responsible for paying for their own items separately. Hmm, I think in the future I will be taking my own check then. Thank you very much. <laughs> Number eight, the fairness effect. Buyers are more sensitive to the price of a product when the price is outside of the range they perceive as fair or reasonable given the purchase context. For example, consumers may perceive surge pricing by ride-sharing apps during peak hours as unfair, leading to negative perceptions of the company's pricing practices. The same rings true for vacation planning during school holidays when all the prices just keep rising. And finally, number nine price presentation order effect. The order in which prices are presented can influence consumer perceptions. For instance, presenting the most expensive option first can make subsequent options seem more affordable by comparison, leading consumers to choose a more expensive option than they initially intended. An example of this is how retailers merchandise products by low to high or high to low pricing based on the customer flow, category flow, and even at the subcategory level. Okay, so now we have completed our mini psych class and you understand the nine laws of price sensitivity and consumer psychology. What do we do next? Surely that's enough, isn't it? Well, yet again, I'm here to say not yet. Next, we have to look at the pricing methodologies and boy, do we have a lot of these to go through. I was looking at a way to do this in threes, but alas, there just wasn't a way to do it. There are so many different pricing methodologies that I also doubt I have picked all of them up in this segment. Yet again though, I have done you right by ensuring these and some bonus extra ones are on the website in the document section with the relevant description. However, if you do have any additional interesting ones, send me the details to the usual place. For now, let's delve into more detail about each pricing tool and technique that could be used in retail. Number one, everyday low pricing or EDLP. With EDLP, retailers can maintain relatively stable low prices on most products without frequent fluctuations or promotions. This strategy aims to build trust and loyalty with customers by assuring them of consistent value every time they shop. It reduces the need for extensive advertising of sales and promotions, which can save on marketing costs. Number two, high-low pricing. High-low pricing involves alternating between periods of higher regular prices and lower prices during sales or promotions. 
The higher regular prices allow the store to maintain profitability, while the lower prices during promotions attract customers, encourage purchases, and potentially reach extra discount slabs given by the suppliers. It also creates a sense of urgency and excitement among customers, who may be more likely to make impulse purchases during a sale period. This would include pricing such as Bog Off or Big If, buy one, get one free. Although this type has started to wane, as retailers realized all they were doing was spoiling a potential future purchase by the customer and it didn't increase demand. Number three, loss leaders. Certain products are intentionally priced below cost to attract customers into the store. The idea is that while customers are drawn in by the loss leader, they will also purchase other items with higher profit margins, thus offsetting the loss. Loss leaders are often prominently displayed and heavily promoted to maximize their effectiveness. This practice is actually outlawed in some countries as a protective measure for competition law. Number four, dynamic pricing. Dynamic pricing involves adjusting prices in real time based on various factors such as demand, competitor pricing, and inventory levels. Retailers can use sophisticated algorithms and data analysis to determine the optimal price for each product at any given time. This allows the retailer to maximize profits by charging a higher price during periods of high demand and adjusting prices downward when demand is lower. Number five, price matching. Some retailers offer to match or beat competitors' prices on identical products. This policy assures customers that they are getting the best deal without having to shop around, which can help retain their loyalty. Price matching policies may have certain restrictions and conditions to prevent abuse. Number six, bundle pricing. Bundle pricing involves offering discounts for purchasing multiple items together as a package. By bundling products together, retailers can encourage customers to buy more items than they initially intended, thereby increasing the average transaction value. Bundles are often themed around related products or complementary items. Number seven, markdowns and clearance sales. Markdowns involve reducing prices on items that are slow moving, seasonal, or approaching their expiration dates. Clearance sales are more aggressive and aim to clear out excess inventory quickly. Markdowns and clearance sales help prevent losses on unsold inventory and free up shelf space for new products. Number eight, membership or loyalty programs. The retailer may offer special discounts, rewards, or exclusive deals to members of their loyalty programs. Members may earn points for every purchase, receive personalized discounts, or even gain access to member-only events or promotions. Loyalty programs incentivize repeat purchases and help retailers gather valuable data about their customers' shopping habits. Number nine, psychological pricing. Psychological pricing strategies leverage the way customers perceive prices to influence their purchasing decisions. Pricing products just below round numbers, for example, 9.99 instead of 10, or using terms like three for five instead of 1.67 each, can generate the perception of lower prices and encourage purchases. Retailers often employ pricing strategies that make prices seem more affordable or attractive to customers. Number 10, seasonal pricing. Seasonal pricing involves adjusting prices based on seasonal demand or product availability. For example, retailers may lower prices on barbecue supplies in the summer or raise prices on holiday themed items during peak season. Seasonal pricing allows retailers to capitalize on fluctuations in demand and maximize profits throughout the year. Number 11, Price optimization software. Price optimization software utilizes advanced algorithms and data analytics to determine the optimal pricing strategy for each product. It considers factors such as demand elasticity, competitor pricing, historical sales data, and the current market conditions. Price optimization software helps retailers maximize profits by setting prices that balance customer demand with profitability. Number 12, volume discounts. This is about offering discounts to customers who purchase larger quantities of a particular product. This encourages bulk purchases and helps retailers move inventory more quickly. Number 13, introductory pricing. 
This one is about introducing a new product at a lower than usual price to encourage trial and adoption. Once the product gains popularity or establishes itself in the market, the price may be raised to a regular level. Number 14, tiered pricing. Now we get to this one, which is about offering different price points for the same product based on factors such as quality, size, or even features. This allows retailers to cater to different customer segments and maximize revenue from each group. Number 15, time-sensitive promotions. Offering short-term promotions or flash sales to create a sense of urgency can drive immediate sales. These time-sensitive promotions are often used to clear out excess inventory or boost sales during slow periods. Number 16, price anchoring. When setting a high initial price for a product, this is to establish a reference point or anchor in the customer's mind. Even if the product is later discounted, customers may perceive it as a good deal compared to the original price. Number 17. Geographic Pricing By adjusting prices based on the geographic location of the store or the local market conditions, this means that prices may vary between different store locations or regions to account for factors such as cost of living and competition. Number 18. Subscription Services by offering subscription-based pricing for products that customers purchase regularly, the customer can then pay a recurring fee to receive products on a regular basis, often at a discounted price, compared to the individual purchases. Amazon seemed to be doing this a lot lately. Number 19. Value-based pricing. This is then setting prices based on the perceived value of the product to the customer, rather than just the cost of production. This strategy focuses on capturing the maximum amount of value that customers are willing to pay for the product. And finally, or maybe not so finally, if you guys send me some new ones, number 20, dynamic bundling. This one is made possible by adjusting bundle offerings based on customer preferences, purchasing history, or even real-time data. By dynamically creating bundles tailored to the individual customers, retailers can increase the likelihood of a purchase and maximize revenue. Okay, so by understanding and effectively implementing these pricing tools and techniques, any retailer can attract customers, increase sales, and optimize their profits in a competitive market environment. Next, we go to the pricing puzzle and how it all finally fits together. Okay, so now we get to the pricing puzzle and learn how it all fits together. These are the six things you need to piece together to make the puzzle work. Three of them have already been discussed in previous episodes. Don't worry, I will highlight them for you. Two of them we have already discussed earlier in this episode. And one is what we will look at now and then how they all fit together. Here are those six components. Number one, pricing objectives. Number two, Pricing psychology. We discussed this in the second segment. Number three, pricing methods. We just discussed this in the last segment. Number four, banners, formats, and geography. This was discussed in the Assortment Chronicles Part 2. Number five, PACAS, P-A-Q-A-S. This was discussed in the Customer Connections episode. Number six, customer segmentation. This was also discussed in the Customer Connections episode. Isn't it amazing how all of a sudden a lot of these episodes seem to be linking together? It's almost like it was planned this way. <laughs> the new one now that you need to think about is the five general objectives to be used when setting prices. Essentially, it's about what are your motives and what do you want to achieve. The five general objectives are, firstly, profit related. Are you trying to maybe maximize current profit and or get a targeted return on investment. Number two, sales related. Are you trying to generate sales growth, get a target market share, or even increased market share? Number three, customer related. Are you trying to win the confidence of customers or just to satisfy customers? Number four, competition related. Are you trying to face the competitors, to keep competitors away, to achieve quality leadership, or even to remove competitors. And number five, finally, 
any other related objectives, such as market penetration, promoting new products, maintaining image and reputation to skim the cream from the market, aid in price stability, or survival and growth. These objectives, by the way, can change from store to store, category to category, product to product. It's a very complex role, and this is why some companies actually have a separate team to manage prices. If we were to look at a quality versus price matrix, where quality was along the y-axis from low at the bottom, then medium, and then high at the top, and then along the x-axis for price, we had low at the left-hand side, medium in the middle, and high on the right, you would end up with a nine-box matrix as follows. Low price and low quality at the extreme bottom left box could be determined as being cheap. Medium price and low quality would be determined as unhappy customers. High price and low quality would be determined as sell and run. A bit like those market traders Dell and Rodney from the BBC sitcom Only Fools and Horses. Medium quality and low price would be perceived as a real bargain. Medium price and medium quality would be perceived as average. Probably, if it was a colour, it would be called beige or meh for the Gen Zers. High price and medium quality would then likely be seen as overpriced. We now move up to the top of the quality level. Low priced but high quality would be perceived as underpriced. This may also put people off as they may question the product's authenticity. Medium price and high quality would be perceived as great and would be ideal for penetration pricing. High price and high quality would definitely be perceived as a premium product. Remember though, that there will always, always, always be someone who can do something cheaper. The old adage about price, speed and quality is simple. You can really only pick two of them. Do remember though, that price is only one element that drives consumer choice. Remember PACAS? price, availability, quality, assortment and service that we talked about in the customer connections episode. You also have to add in the four category roles and then all of the characteristics that surrounded those two. Is it destination, preferred, convenience or occasional? And is it about image creating, traffic building, profit contribution, transaction building or excitement creating? Finally, you must add in the customer dimensions based around RFM, recency, frequency and monetary, and the customer segmentation based around demographics, geographics, psychographics and behavioural traits too, before digging even deeper into the customer baskets to understand consumer lifestyles and how that impacts what price you charge for the products you want to sell. Ultimately, the objectives whichever ones you choose, are then wrapped with the psychologies, the nine different ones, and finally the pricing methods, the ones already described, to finally come up with a price that both you and the customer are satisfied with. When this exercise was performed by Tesco in the UK, it came down to a single product. Tesco Everyday Value Spread was essentially used by two different customer segments. One used it as an ingredient, the other used it as a spread. How to keep them both happy was to price using the EDLP, Everyday Low Price Method. So, now it's all over to you. And yes, we made it. We managed to uncover the truth behind pricing and the tactics and psychology used by us, the retailers. Hopefully, this has also given you the tools needed to get out there and start to set your own pricing strategy to encourage your customers to buy more with you. In this episode, we have covered the following three simple things. Firstly, we went deep into the nine laws of price sensitivity and consumer psychology developed by Herman Simon the renowned economist, to ensure we had a full understanding of how price and consumer behaviour works. Secondly, there was a long peek into the various different pricing methodologies, along with some examples of how these work and what impact they have. And then thirdly, we put together the pricing puzzle 
that looked at the six elements that all have to be pieced together, including how previous episodes slotted in neatly with this one. My final thoughts here. Price is a complex topic. Along the journey, there are several pitfalls, including a disastrous loss of profit if you do not get it right. The key here is that pricing should not fall to one person alone. By building up your assortment strategy document, episodes three and four, and understanding the customer, episode five, and then adding in this episode's insights, you can start to craft a picture of pricing that will be rich and varied and will improve your profitability. A huge thanks for tuning in, my Retail 101ers. Got a burning question or comments? You know where to find me, LinkedIn, X, or drop a message on the retail101online.com website. And of course, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and ring that bell wherever you get your podcast fix, so you never miss out on the excitement of our next episode drop. Cheers to the retail revolution! And that's it, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll see you in the next episode, maybe in a couple of weeks' time. Cheers.